Simon Chadwick. I'm Professor. I am Simon Chadwick. I am Professor of Eurasian Sport at Ian Leon Business School. I'm really pleased to uh, to welcome, uh, uh, and I'm going to say this as I see it on the screen, Maggie, Ariana, Kwame, and Fabian uh, this afternoon. We're going to be talking about athlete activism. Fabian has to leave us uh, about 30 minutes through, so I'm I'm not, not going to engage in, in I'm not going to engage in too much preamble. Too much preamble. Um, I am going to front load the questions a little bit towards Fabienne, and then we can talk about other things once he's gone. Actually, we'll, we'll talk about him when he's gone, um, but don't tell him that. Uh, but what I want to do is to kind of launch straight in and just ask very, very simple, straightforward question, a minute each. Maggie, who are you and what do you do? Hi Simon, thank you very much. My name is Maggie Alfonsi. I'm a former England women's rugby player, uh, represented my country 74 times over an 11-year period. I'm now retired, won a Rugby World Cup medal, uh, tried to get to the Olympics as a shot put thrower, unfortunately didn't make it. Uh, but now I am a broadcaster, so I am a pundit working on men's and women's rugby. I absolutely love it. Um, and I also work in sports governance, uh, effectively well, in the world of rugby union for the Rugby Football Union. Okay, and don't mention England, France, because I've had to deal with that one over the last week or two. So, oh. Ariana, <laughs> Ariana, over, you next. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Simon. Um, I don't really want to follow after Maggie. I don't have any big time trophies or medals as beautiful and shiny as she does, but I'm a current player at Paris Saint-Germain, and I also work on the business side, leading our women's sponsorship team. Uh, hopefully, I will get a medal this year, but it's not looking good with our return leg against... Leon, hopefully everybody here watching will come watch us and support us so we can beat them in Champions League and also in the league, but we'll see. And yeah, glad everybody's here and hopefully we can shine some light on what's happening around the world. Yeah, that was remarkably modest of you, Ariana, to say that you don't compare with Maggie with Paris Saint-Germain logo, logo behind you. So uh, Yeah, but when I walk out of here, that thing stays here. Maggie, everywhere she goes, her trophies go with her. So I'm yeah, not being modest. I, I'm being totally I serious. I, I, don't have, I, I don't have a logo. I don't have a logo. I don't have a logo. Yeah, Kwame. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, great to be here. Um, my name is Kwame Ajaman. I'm an associate professor of sport management um, here at Ohio State University in the States. I've been here about two years, um, studying many of the topics that we'll be discussing today, including athlete activism under the, I guess, broader realm of institutional and social change. Um, looking forward, very much looking forward to the conversation. Thank you, Kwame. Fabian. Yes, uh, hello everyone, and very happy to be to be with you today. Um, so I've been in the sports industry for for more than fifteen years. Uh, started my career in sports marketing, then I moved to talent representation, working with uh, activist athletes uh, such as Serena Williams, for example. Um, and uh, two years ago, we started Seventeen Sports, which is the world first sports impact company, working at this intersection of sports, business, and purpose. And we work with brands, properties, athletes and non-profit, how to do good and do well. Can, can I just ask you about the 17 and 17 sports? Could you, could you explain the significance of that for, yeah, for sure. people who don't know? Absolutely, with pleasure. Uh, I mean, we, we started 17 sports to, to solve a problem. And the problem we identified was the fact that the, the sports industry uh, of, obviously is growing a lot, but uh, the focus has been very on profit and entertainment. And the contribution to the society has been very little and, and really through the lens of CSR and of philanthropy. Where I think today as the world is changing very, very quickly, uh, we, we want to show that it's possible to do good and do well. Uh, and actually by leading with purpose, you can really deliver positive financial, but also social and environmental outcomes. And the 17 SDG are referring to the 17 global goals, of course, from the UN agenda, uh, but also to the goal 17, which is about uh, partnerships and collaboration, because I think today it's really about that. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Fabienne. If I could go to you, to you firstly, uh, Kwame, and, and um, before I do that, I have to remember, for members of, for members of the audience, uh, you are uh, able to send in questions. Um, so please do. Uh, um, post in the, in the chat forum and, I, and I'll try and ask these questions as we go through. Um, please be aware that, that I will moderate the question. So um, I apologize in advance if, if uh, you, you, you don't get your question answered, but uh, I will certainly try to do so. So yeah, just to, just to, to, to go back to you, uh, Kwame, um, we saw last night England International in 
couple of players at Wembley taking a knee before their game against San Marino. We saw Norwegian players take to the field on Wednesday wearing human rights t-shirts, uh, t-shirts a reference to um, uh, uh, immigrant labour rights in, in, um, in, in Qatar. Why are we seeing this? What, what has happened over the last decade or so that has led to this, this growth in athlete activism, do you think? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, it's one that I've discussed and debated in my classes with my students uh, for, I guess, maybe dating back to 2014, 15-ish, um, whenever we saw the Miami Heat uh, with the infamous you know, hoodie um, picture after Trayvon Martin was killed. Um, but I think there's a number of reasons, but some, a couple that stand out for me are, I think today's athlete, when we think about particularly the high profile ones, uh, they're essentially, you know, like many corporate entities. So I wrote about this in a 2010 uh, manuscript and referenced uh, Jay-Z line, um, for some of you may recall in Diamonds Forever Remix, whenever Jay-Z stated, I'm not a businessman, I'm a business man. And I think that same kind of rationale could be applied to athletes. When we think about people like some Serena Williams or LeBron James, among many others. And I say, I bring this up because as, soci as a society research is showing that um, more than 50% of us people, like consumers, we expect corporate brands to, you know, speak up on social issues. And um, I think, you know, Fabian will be able to speak to this as well. And I think it's plausible that we hold high profile athletes to the same expectation as well. You know, research is showing 67% of millennials, Gen Zers, we want CEOs and corporate brands to speak up on social issues and tackle them. And I think we're seeing the same thing with the athletes. And I think beyond that, I think uh, the advent of social media, you know, camera phones, um, it's also played a big role. And, you know, it's forced many of us to kind of uh, reckon with what some of us previously ignored. You know, camera phones have brought, you know, people face to face with uh, the, you know, killing, at least here in the, uh, the, the States, Black men. Um, and I think athletes, uh, particularly Black athletes, some of whom have came from these communities, uh, they feel they can't stay silent anymore. And of course, that's, you know, I'm speaking to, you know, what I write about in terms of Black male athletes, Black athletes in general, but I think the same could hold true for a number of the other social issues of our time. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Kwame. And, 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 yeah, um, Maggie, uh, would you agree with that? I mean, Kwame obviously talked about some deep, very deep and very profound social issues in the United States, but highlighted digital technology uh, you know, from, from a European or more specifically a British perspective. Do you see it in the same way or do you see activism differently? Interesting. I mean, just listen to what Kwame is saying. I think uh, I just wrote, I wrote down some bits that he said. And I think the things that first came to my light was that definitely as an athlete, I'm, I'm retired now, but I still have a brand. And actually, I do have to sort of um, look to be leading with purpose, look to be um, doing the right things and also speaking up for those who don't have a voice. So that's quite significant. I think definitely the idea of branding and also you mentioned about social media. So I think we all know it's, it's created a greater awareness. Um, previously, there's things that we didn't know or actually maybe there's times we probably were ignorant that we didn't want to know or didn't want to react. And now I think uh, many athletes are almost encouraged to react and say things. It's still quite interesting that when you think about athlete activism, you know, we've, we've seen more, so I can only speak from over, us over here in Europe, but we're seeing more athletes, yes, speak up, but still there's, there's still a large percentage of athletes that don't speak up. And I think it's interesting, like when I think about over here, uh, the national governing bodies that obviously support those athletes, sometimes are silencing them. You know, I speak up more because I am not in the sport. So I am now retired. I have, I am my own business, my own brand. So I have, I have more of a greater voice. But I know many athletes in sporting organisations who are competing right now, who are fighting for places, who won't say a lot. So it's really interesting. Like when you see Lewis Hamilton, who's very open and very you know, confident with what he's saying. Um, but again, he's his own, he's he's such a big man. He's well known. He's you know, Mercedes will never drop him. You know, so it does make you kind of question as well activism you know, who has the voice, who's able to have a voice and, and the organisation surrounding them, who's silencing them or who's not giving them a platform to speak. That's a really interesting uh, answer, 
and 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 I'm going to come back to, to to some of the things that you've said a little later. But just just for the people who don't know you, uh, you, you do speak out and and you do have very strong views on certain subjects. Can you give us a sense of what what? It, apologies if, it, if this seems crude, but if you are a brand with purpose, Maggie Alfonsi, what is your purpose? So um, I guess my purpose is very much around equality. So diversity and inclusion is significant for me in, in particular. So I guess I'm very much one around sexism, like closing that down, especially recently. I've been, I work in broadcasting, was working on the men's rugby six nations. Uh, I'm, not, I'm one of a few other women who work in uh, punditry in men's and women's rugby, but I got a lot of sexist abuse. So I'm very much on one to speak out about that. Um, and, and again, I talk a lot around uh, diversity and inclusion. So particularly in regards to race and equality in that respect. So uh, I'm, I'm part of the Rugby Football Union Council. I'm one one person of colour um, and the people in the council is a, is a significant number and I'm the only person of colour. So I guess my role there is very much around how do we get, how do we make the sport in particular rugby union a sport for all? So those are, those are the areas I speak up quite openly about, but also, you know, I, I listen as well. It's not just speaking out, it's about listening and talking and hearing the voices that aren't always given the opportunity to speak. Okay, thank you, Maggie. Now, we've, Ariana, we've, we've had a, a view from Kwame from, from, the United States. We've had a view from Maggie from from Britain, former athlete. You are a, you are from the United States, but you're a current athlete. So, you know, seeing from the inside, where do you think this um, this this surge or this movement or this spirit has come from? And and you know, when you're looking at the people around you, you're looking at the athletes around you. What what kind of activism activist activities are they engaged in? I mean, I think there's always been some sort of athlete activism always happening. If you talk to any woman who's played a sport, they've always been act, uh, been an activist. If you think about it, just by lacing up their boots and stepping on the field when most of the time they weren't supposed to be doing it. So I would say it's probably women and a, and a lot of people from certain races and cultures have kind of been activists their whole life. There's one thing that's really important for me that I'd like to say, though. Um, I don't think athletes have to be activists. I think Kwame touched on it and he might think of it differently. I think that if you have something you believe in and you want to use your platform, I think that's fabulous and you absolutely should and you have a great platform and a great voice. But I think sometimes we're forcing athletes to try to be something they're not and it's not going to come off authentic and their voice isn't going to be heard well. And I've got players, friends, colleagues that I know that just don't like public speaking or they get really uncomfortable and they're afraid they're going to say something wrong and not be able to express themselves in the correct way or shed light in the right way to whatever they want to be promoting. And I think at this moment, we're almost trying to put too much pressure on athletes to step up and to do things that they're not ready yet or they're just not in a position for themselves to speak up about. If they see something, yes, you should say something, but I don't think athletes have an obligation because they're an athlete to try to find a cause that they believe in. I think first and foremost, they need to be perform on the field and then they can do extra things that they believe in. But until they believe in it, I don't think we should be forcing athletes to step up. Can I just uh, go back to your very, very first point? And, and you probably saw I, I tipped my head and, and as a, as a middle-class middle-aged white guy, um, I think your, your observation about, you know, women in sport and, and, and people from different heritages in sport and, and for, with, with um, different physical conditions, you know, maybe there are, there's always been activism, but you know, perhaps we haven't paid enough attention to it. Certainly people like me perhaps haven't paid enough attention to it in the past. So thank you for that observation. That was a really good one. Um, Fabian, from your side, how did we get here? How do you think we got here? Oh, I mean, to Ariana's point, I think, yes, athletes' activism have, all, have, have existed for, for many, many decades, actually, with different eras, uh, I would say. Uh, it started in the 60s, 70s, with athletes which were very vocal, uh, as we know, but were, they were also punished from being very, uh, very active on, on talk about talking on, on social issues. After we had uh, maybe in the 80s, 90s, some athletes who were really commercially focused, trying to raise and build their brand and to maximize their earnings through endorsements. And now we're getting back to the roots with this new emergence of, of, uh, of athletes who want to use their voice and their platform to drive positive change. Uh, I think we are already at a pivotal moment, uh, especially because I mean, the consumers, and I think it's going to grow with the next generation, but really the consumers, the fans are expecting brands, athletes to really stand for something. Uh, 
um, and and yeah, I think it's uh, it's critical that the athletes um, can uh, can can be very authentic about it. Uh, I think the big difference is that today they don't. I mean, being vocal, they don't. It doesn't eliminate eliminate opportunities for them. Whether maybe a couple of decades ago, where even in 2016, when Colin Kaepernick talked about his his, uh, his, his activism, I mean, he was not a, a, an NFL player anymore. Um, and I think it's changing a lot. And I think today it's going to be be amplified more and more over over time over the years. Um, okay, can I just, can I just pick up on that word amplification? You said that it will be amplified. Um, how will it be amplified and, and, and why do you think it will be amplified? I, I think it's going to be amplified because the, the next generation of fans, they don't want to be passive. They want to be actively involved in doing good as well, in supporting causes, in, in being part of the journey. So I, I, I really believe, uh, I mean, of course, athletes have multi-dimension and there are more than athletes. Um, and they have this opportunity to also open and to attract a, a more broader reach of fans. And of course, the, the, I mean, with the rise of social media, digital social media platforms and, and, and many more, I think today they, they have a huge platform and I think it's, it's just the beginning, basically. Now, Kwame, Maggie, Ariana, if I may, uh, can I just stick with Fabian because Fabian, I know, has to uh, to leave us shortly. Um, can no, I, absolutely can... not. <laughs> okay, fine. We'll just finish here now, then, shall we? Right. See you, Fabian, next time. And thanks for it. Okay. I knew I shouldn't have invited you on again, Ariana. That's the last time. Can I stick with you, Fabian? Uh, you work with with brands, with businesses. Um, what what are what are they thinking and, and what are they saying about what we're now going through, what we're now encountering? Uh, what, what are their views? Is it something to be frightened about? Is it something they embrace? Do they see it commercially? Do they genuinely care? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, I, I think I think there is a lot of education to do today uh, around purpose because I mean, still many leaders. Uh, don't really understand the difference between purpose, CSR, sustainability. It's it's very difficult, and of course you have a lot of washing behind this. Um, but I think it's a journey. I think it's really it's going to take time. I think the brands and the corporations they have no choice because they're under pressure. Uh, I think the risk is not to to go through this transformation because I think it's a complete transformation of an organization that the leaders have to really undertake. Um, I think it takes time, it has to be authentic, but it's not marketing. Um, I, I really believe that now the brands are shifting and, and we are talking to many CMO, CEO um, every, every week and, and we are starting to see that they, they are shifting their investment in sports from the traditional platforms where they used to invest to purpose-driven platforms where they can express their corporate purpose. So I think it's, it's, it's really growing and growing. And I think now, I mean, many brands will try to, to invest in sports really as a way to express their, their, their purpose and at the end to drive business, but also to drive positive change. Uh, I think it's really growing. And I mean, every region is different. Um, I think it's also related to the culture of a, of a company. Uh, in Japan, for example, when, when Naomi Osaka was very vocal last year, I mean, I know that many, many, uh, most of the sponsors she has were, I mean, very, very skeptical how to react to this because it's not part of the cult, Japanese culture. And, and most of the Japanese sponsors prefer to have athletes that are very obedient and very quiet. And she was very vocal. So that was very difficult for them to, have, to, to deal with that. And they, they remain neutral in the end. But, I think it's changing over time, but uh, I believe the brands, they have no choice. And I think uh, like the digital transformation a couple of years ago, if you don't really transform uh, and embrace that opportunity, you may become irrelevant. Thank you, Fabian. Can I, can I ask a similar kind of question to you, Kwame, because I know you also run a consultancy as, as well as being an academic. And, and if, you could, if you could talk us through stateside, you know, what, what brands, what what businesses are thinking about but i but i also wondered if you you 
you have a view on cultural context, because I, I particularly liked what Fabian said about the Japanese and, and the cultural context of protesting in Japan. So Kwame, uh, sponsors, companies, brands, in, in the United States, what are they thinking, feeling, but also do you have a view on cultural context? Yeah, so um, to my limited knowledge with regard to sponsors and whatnot, I think a lot of sponsors are stepping up, particularly more recently as, a, as of you know, May, June-ish when you know, George Floyd was killed. Up until then, I think you would see a lot of sponsors kind of uh, maybe be neutral um, but now they're essentially, you know, being forced to at least engage in these conversations, maybe not being politically active, um, so to speak, but at least starting to engage in the conversation. So after, you know, George Floyd was killed, um, we saw a number of sponsors, for instance, Adidas, you know, they tweeted, um, it was like a 10 straight tweets in a row saying that we have, we've been, we failed in this area, Black athletes have very much made us who we are today. So that's something that we hadn't seen before, right? Um, you know, Nike, some years back, they did the commercial with Colin Kaepernick. Um, so that was a that was a big step because we hadn't seen a lot of uh, corporate, big name corporate sponsors step up, step up in this in this fashion. So I think we're going to see more of it because, unfortunately, um, so a lot of corporate sponsors see it as a big business kind of thing and a marketing tool because. Um, as I alluded to earlier, uh, younger generations, they like that kind of thing, right? So whenever, you know, Nike comes out with a special shoe um, for Colin Kaepernick, they know that younger generations are going to flock to the stores or online to, you know, buy that particular shoe. Um, we saw Ben and Jerry's, who's been on kind of the forefront of uh, racial justice and other social issues here. And, you know, they have a special ice cream just for Colin Kaepernick. So I think, like I said, I think we're going to see, you know, a lot more of that. And to the cultural question, um, I mean, yeah, it matters a lot. Here in the United States, it's been a, it's been part of the culture, sports and politics, um, even though a lot of people say they shouldn't intersect, they've intersected for a long time, you know, dating back, you know, many decades. Um, so it's more kind of, we're used to it over here. But if you think about somewhere you know, like Belarus, for instance, you know, a lot of some athletes were protesting more recently and um, about, I guess, you know, human rights and the elections being kind of rigged um, last year. And um, a lot of sponsors backed away, the government suspended a lot of the athletes. Uh, so, you know, you know, cultural context, you know, plays an integral part in the way that corporate, you know, sponsors react and um, others as well. I'm going to take. Uh, I'm going to come to, to to Maggie and Ariana in just a second. Um, then I'm going to go to you, Fabian, just for a final word before you uh, you disappear. Then uh, I've got two questions from old friends, so I'll I'll come to the the questions in in just a moment. But uh, as we're in this area of, of of sponsors and commercial partners and endorsement deals and, and such like, you know, Ariana. Do you have conversations with these kinds of organizations and brands about you and your beliefs and your values and and if you like you know, in terms of brand purpose, your purpose or or are these conversations that you that, that don't really take place? Which hat am I wearing? You can wear as many hats as you want all at the same time. Well, from the perspective of a player, I try to create my brand through my social media and the type of webinars I choose to, choose to participate in. So brands would know what my stance is and what my purpose is without me necessarily having to, to speak it to them. Um, from a sponsorship perspective, uh, I personally try to reach out to more brands that I think align with the values that PSG is going in the direction of more sustainability and things like that, that as a team, we can make a difference and, and have a voice on. Uh, those are obviously communicated much more than as the player and the brand and what you are. I, I think players today try to create themselves as a brand and try to do things to where everyone knows what they stand for, where the, the brands come to them because of those reasons. The brands already know that they would align rather than, I don't know, give them a quiz or some sort of like personality test uh, to see if they can adapt or see if they can match up with some, some of those issues. This, uh, there is a question from Noor Nazrallah. Hi, Noor. 
old friend. Can I ask, I'll ask this to you, Ariana. Do you ever feel as though, you know, to use uh, Noah's words, that, that, that this is a marketing stunt for some brand? And, and I guess Fabian might come back to that in a short, in, in a short while. Or, or do you feel that, that, that brands and partners are genuine and legitimate? As an athlete, do you feel as, as though it's a stunt? No, I think some, some things are completely stunts. Um, I don't want to go too much into this because I know that Fabian needs to leave, but I'm sure that Maggie can jump in and help me with this. Teams, clubs, brands that decide to start working with women just because that's what they're supposed to be doing right now. And that's the image that they want to be showing the world. The athletes themselves learn really quickly and can feel it real fast that the brand, it's not authentic. They don't actually care about us. Um, we're only here because they have to check a box and they're not developing us or strategically moving women's sport in the right direction. I think this probably crosses over to most things within this area. And I think that players, fans also can see when things aren't authentically. I think sometimes it trickles down to the fans less quickly because if you see a commercial or you see them showing brands or, or putting money, you assume that they believe in it, but that's not always the case. And it's still, especially in women's sports, you're really feeling it and seeing it. Um, I think somebody commented too, look what just happened in the uh, March Madness for women's basketball, seriously. Like they couldn't make two versions of everything to prove women and men. I mean, they gave them bad food. That's just unfathomable to me. So um, yeah, I'll let you bounce over to Fabian before I go too much on a rant on that. Well, yeah, yeah, you wanted to bring Maggie in. So can I can I just bring Maggie in quickly no. on that? Because, <laughs> okay, Ariana, go, leave. It's, it's, it's either you or me, or shall I just leave and leave you? Know, I'll leave you to chat. Okay, Maggie. Yeah, I'm, I mean, Ariana. I'm sorry, sorry, can I just say, Ariana, I am English. At least Maggie is here. <laughs> she understands. I'm being English. <laughs> Ariana is absolutely spot on, though. Unfortunately, there are some uh, sponsors that are not legitimate about how they support women's sport. I think the challenge we have, though, in women's sport is not all women's sport is well funded. So if we look at football, football is absolutely you know phenomenal globally. Lots of sponsors want to throw themselves at them. But there's some sports, which women's sports, which are very small and rely on those sponsors. So if those sponsors come come knocking at your door, you almost you have to take them. You have to bite the hand off almost because financially they're going to help hopefully grow your sport. But um, Ariane is also absolutely right. You spot the ones which are really authentic. You know, I, I also work as director for Vitality Health, um, and we we're very much around sponsoring former athletes who have an authentic leadership about them. So if we look at our sponsors at Vitality, we've got the likes of Jessica Ennis Hill, Mario Toji, Donnie Wilkinson, um, and a few others. And that's all about having people who are very much down a certain brand. And Ariana also highlighted it. You know, the athletes show what their brand is, and we go to them. It's not usually the other way around. And I think that's what's been very key. It's about finding the athletes that have the brand that sort of sit, that meet and align with what the company's um, core values are as well. Can I just say before I go, Fabian, you're going to get you're going to get a minute to uh, to round off your contribution before you disappear. I um, and, and I am going to talk to Ariana in spite of the fact that she's trying to wind me up. I am going to. Uh, um, the, I don't know if you saw it, Ariana, the Angels SC Birdies deal, which I thought was, if you look at the mechanics of the Angels SC Birdies deal, that's actually a really cool deal. Um, if people are unfamiliar with Angel SC, this is uh, Eva Longoria and, and various others who set up a, a, a football club in the United States. And Birdies is, a, is a, a, a women's football footwear brand. And part of the deal is about mentoring program, involves mentoring programs for, for, for young women. I think it's a really, really interesting deal. Um, do take a look at it if, you, if you're unfamiliar with it. Fabian, I'll, I, you can say whatever you want, Fabian. I've lost control completely, thanks to Ariana. No, so you, you, you can say whatever you want. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm just sorry to, to, be, to, to have to leave. And it's such an exciting and very deep topic. I think, I mean, everyone definitely brings a lot of great insights. Uh, for me, I mean, purpose sponsorship is about solving a problem. I think this is what matters at the end. So what try to, when you step up and, and, and start to, to, to get your brand or your name in sponsorship, what type of problem you are trying to solve? And what are you doing for that? I think this is really the key question you need to ask yourself as a brand, as a leader. And I think it changed the world perspectives. Um, and at the end of the day, it's really trying to measure the concrete outcomes you get out of it. Um, but I think athletes are really taking the power because they are very energetic, uh, like uh, like we discussed. And uh, 
I think the, the properties, the clubs are really seeing some threat here because they see that the athletes are really getting the fans, they are attracting the sponsors uh, because they are much more authentic and, and very aligned in, in everything they do. So yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting what's going on. But as I said, I think it's, uh, we are having an interesting time and, uh, and I'm excited to see what's going to come in the next 10 years. Fabien, thank you very much for being here. No, I'm, and, I'm, thank, and you. thank you to you all. Um, thank you 17, 17 Sport is, uh, is an organization worth, uh, worth watching and, and, and Fabian's views on the world, uh, including your book, Fabian, which is obviously on the website, is, uh, yeah. is, is interesting to look at. So thank you, Fabian. For thank you so here. much for your time. Thank you. As, thank you. Okay, as, 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 as Fabian uh, disappears stage left, can I go back to, to some of the questions because we've actually got quite a few questions coming in, in now from the audience. The first, uh, the next one is from Sam. Hi, Sam. Uh, I, is it, are people here? Do I know everybody who's turned up today? Um, hi, Sam. Sam is asking Kwame, uh, how do you see the NCAA equality issues that have been highlighted at March Madness playing out? You got a view on that, Kwame? Uh, I mean, to be honest, I wasn't I wasn't surprised. Uh, we've seen unequal, um, inequal treatment uh, when it comes to NCAA sports um, in general here in the U.S. and particularly when we think about you know women's basketball. But I think uh, you know with this again, you know, going back to social media, if it wasn't for social media, these inequalities wouldn't have been um, seen by the masses like they were this past you know few weeks so um but it's not to say you know we've seen this before and we still haven't seen any major major changes so i'm a little i guess i'm more pessimistic in terms of uh you know thinking that there's going to be some big changes but you can you know hope for the best um as we move forward okay thank you uh, thank you kwame i I'm doing it, doing this against doing this against my better judgment. But Ariana. Oh, sorry, I just want to jump in on and what Kwame was saying though, something that I especially saw, and it's only because social I, I think it's definitely social media is having the biggest influence and athletes can use their platform or they can go live and it's holding brands and things responsible. Whether the brands who were doing it as a stunt, and this also goes to what Maggie said, and Maggie, it's in women's football too. Sometimes we don't, we align with brands that we might not necessarily like, but we also need money in women's football. We're definitely not there yet. It's probably the most viewed women's sport at the moment, but we still have to do a lot of things that might not always align with what we'd really like to be doing. But there was a lot of brands that popped up like, um orange theory um there was a couple other i want to say maybe dick sporting goods or something like that who all came out and said oh they didn't give you equipment we'll give you guys equipment tell us when and where and we'll ship it and they were doing it through social media and again it might have been stunts but at least those athletes were getting the products that they needed to be getting to perform at the highest level and i think this is a positive thing that all of this is also kind of coming to light that as Kwame said, maybe the NCAA won't make a difference, but at least next year, those brands might be knocking on the door to say, we'll give you guys the equipment. We're here to support you. And we're gonna try to make women have the opportunities that they should to perform at the highest level. Can, can I stick with you, uh, Ariana, and then I'll come to you, Maggie. There's a question in about uh, the environment and activism. And, and if we think about Hector Bayarin at, uh, at, at Arsenal, who is, is very vocal in his, his views about um, the environment and sustainability. When you sat on the, in the dressing room, uh, Ariana, at PSG, and I think Ariana might be frozen. No, she's back again. Ariana, when you sat in the dressing room at PSG, are, are, are players talking about the environment? And do they, do they see this as, 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 as a cause, if we can call it that, as a cause that they want to be vocal about? Again, I think this is just a personal issue that some people have. And so in the locker room, I know quite a bit about most of my teammates. So I know who's passionate about what causes or what's closer to people's hearts than others. Um, so some of the women that I sit with at lunch or in certain parts of the dressing room absolutely are passionate about the environment or sustainability or things like that. There was a recent Netflix documentary that one of my teammates watched. So that became like a topic of conversation for three days around the lunch table. And her speaking up about it, had two others watch it that afternoon to come back to the next day to discuss what was happening to the planet and the penguins and um, 
all things like this. And so I think the conversations are coming up. I don't think everybody is passionate about the same thing, but I think that's normal. I think even on a team, it's a microcosm of the whole world from country, culture, religion, nationality. Some people are friendlier and, and better because they just click their personalities and some people aren't. Again, Maggie can probably back that one up. Uh, so I would say, yeah, the environment comes up just like race would come up, just like religion can come up in our conversations, but not everybody kind of activates on one of those things. Everybody just has their own and, and it's kind of cool that we can discuss all of those things with each other and, and try to find out more. Mm. Maggie, the environment, is, is, is this something that, that, that you hear people talking about in, in sport? You know what's really interesting, just come to Ariana's point about, um, you know, when you're in when you're in that team environment, definitely there's players who speak up about certain things that are really important to them. I think what I find quite interesting, I don't know if it's away from your question, Simon, but um, it's almost like the peer pressure that, that happens as a result of this activism, I guess you want to call it. For example, Black Lives Matter, you know, over here consistently people are talking about who's taking the knee, especially when a team is about to play. And actually you see almost some players don't want to do it, but there's a peer pressure to do it. And it's quite interesting when you think about how we get influenced by the, the individuals around us in that environment because we're a team, we're, especially I'm talking about collective team, because we're a team almost, we, we're influenced by those around us. And sometimes we take a step that we don't necessarily want to take. I've seen that quite a lot, especially with the, the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, does everyone follow that same cause? Um, and, if, and if not, because the team is standing for that, almost everyone has to follow it. So it's just quite a discussion bit. And I don't know if I've taken off, come away from your tangent. Of what Not at all. We, we, yeah. this is, these are the kind of things that we want to talk about. And, and immediately as you're speaking, I'm thinking about uh, Wilfried Zaha at Crystal mm -hmm. Palace, who said, I'm, I'm not taking a knee, I'm going to stand. Um, and, and he gave his reasons for that. So I, 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 I think what's really interesting for, the, for, for perhaps people who are not involved in being athletes in, in, in the room today to hear these things from you is actually really, really important. I think the other thing that, that, that strikes me about what's being said is, um, you know, I have views about the world as well. Um, no, so but I, do you? I, 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 actually, I don't. They were, they were beaten out of me by Ariana. Ariana said I couldn't have views anymore, so she beat me up and said, "Just forget about all those things." Um, but of course, yeah, when I when I when I'm when I'm in a, in an office with staff, we you know we don't constantly talk about the environment, and we don't constantly talk about you know, socioeconomic disadvantage. You know, we do also talk about other things as well. So I think. Now, for people who are in the room, we're, very often we project things onto people like you, Maggie and Ariana, I think, that, that you, know, you do actually lead normal lives and you are normal people as well. So, 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 so can I come off the back of that? So I think, yeah. especially now that I'm in the broadcasting, obviously I'm not playing anymore, on a regular basis, my Twitter, Twitter timeline does have a lot of, I get sometimes uh, things that happen in the environment that, I, that people want me to speak up on. And that can be quite hard because some of the things, again, I don't necessarily believe in or stand for but you, you feel that because you're the you're the person who has the platform you're the visible person that people can see and you have a voice people come to you to be able to to voice that and that can be really hard and I feel for athletes who are competing right now because if, if they get that all the time and you feel like you need to do something or say something there's that pressure all the time where me as a broadcaster you know, again I say what I want to say and I, and I echo or you know uh, magnify what people's other voices may be which which i believe in but it's a really difficult one i do think athletes get bombarded with stuff which they feel like they have to speak on mm -hmm. so for, for for those students in the room in particular and, and for those sports fans who are in the room you know beware your projections onto others because uh, it's it's sometimes not them it, it's sometimes you um, just to, to go to the chat because so our, our scripted questions, which is what inevitably does happen, we, we, we drift off, uh, we're just jamming. Hey, I, I said we would just jam. Um, the first, uh, first thing in the chat forum is, is anybody who's here now, Justina, uh, a German student researching activism by athletes in sport, has a survey, please answer the survey, please respond to the survey. Estelle, thank you very much. Uh, we talked about, to, 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 uh, to a certain extent, Japan with, with Fabienne, but Kwame, Ariana, Maggie, any of you do, you, do you want to make a particular comment about activism in different parts of the world? If you don't, that's fine. I'll throw in, Estelle, what, what really interests me, Estelle, is how is athlete activism going to play out, for example, at the Winter Olympics in uh, Beijing next year? Because I think a notion of, the notion of activism in China may well be 
significantly different to the notion of activism elsewhere in the world. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Rene, pundits are confronted with the notion <clears throat> they should stay in lane, stick to their sports. Is there a consensus answer or reaction to this frankly horrible take that you are utilizing when it happens to you? Uh, any views on, on you know, really what athletes should do is stick to what they do and they shouldn't say anything? So I'll speak first because, I, again, I'm a pundit and I've got a load of abuse to say as a woman, I shouldn't speak on men's men's rugby. Um, so I guess the way I've approached things has very much been the opposite. I amplify my voice. Uh, it gives more of a reason to stay uh, in, in the industry to speak on men's and women's sport. Um, I think the challenge is that you're seeing in more of it. And, I, and, I, and I, someone else was talking to me about this, you know, why are we seeing much more social abuse? Uh, targeted at pundits in particular to say again stay in your lane stick to what you know I guess you know the pandemic has really made things quite challenging and people feel the need to to air their views on social media uh, and also think you know a lot of pundits are definitely standing up to that um, you see I, I can only say I see it more with women I don't necessarily see it across in other uh, with men as much but I see it more with more people criticizing women and we've seen it a lot over here in the United Kingdom so myself I got a lot of it uh, Sonia McLaughlin got a lot of it recently uh, with regards to working on the men's rugby as well so we've, we've, we've seen a lot of that um, I can only talk for rugby really but I, what I'm what I'm pleased to see is I'm seeing more women come out like an army and we are not going anywhere and actually more of us are now starting to have more of a voice and, and I guess if we want to term it activism we're all, all speaking out about the current situation and, and as a result of that more people are wanting to follow. Simon, you're on mute. You're on mute, Simon. Um, I actually think you make a really good uh, point there, Maggie, because obviously I know that, that you had received um, some fairly strident social media posts that you should you know, stop talking about men's rugby. Um, and then the point that you made about activism. So I, I think you know, activism, again, is just a label that we've used to describe this, this webinar today. But in actual fact, there are some really much more profound and, and far deeper issues there like you know, men can comment on women's sport but women are not allowed to comment on men's sport and, and I think that's again a carry away from 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 the session today Ariana oh, yeah, well, sorry Maggie so I was just gonna say I was talking to another rugby pundit and he said when he speaks on men's women's rugby he gets labeled a hero everyone's like oh my god it's amazing that you're working in women's women's rugby but then when a, a female like myself works in men's rugby they're like what are you doing you don't know what you're talking about get off the sport so it's amazing how quickly the different perceptions are for different genders mm. ariana you want to concur with that yes i absolutely concur with that i think it's it's ironic and, and i think i'm really hoping that one day uh, for for all of these things that we just I don't think we can ever just talk about sport and it can't just be rugby and you have to decipher it in some way men's rugby or women's rugby i just hope one day we say men's rugby and women's rugby and then if we give both of them the, that the word before it will change everything if we say the men's world cup in qatar and the women's world cup will be in australia and we add that in i think that will make the balance that we need but i absolutely agree with what maggie said that goes down to even the simple thing where if a man talks about taking care of the kids for the weekend and people applaud him, it's his kids. Like, should he get paid as a babysitter? It's It should be absolutely normal that you're hanging out with your dad this weekend because mom's got something to do and, and vice versa. So I think these are all things that hopefully one day will be more normalized. And there was just one more thing too that Maggie kind of brought up that I just would like to share. Athletes are also, people reach out to athletes a lot to stand up or to be an ambassador or to use their voice. Um, Athletes have a voice and also just a time frame in a day of so many hours that they can't talk and discuss or try to step up, step up for every single thing. And I think sometimes they get slack for that or people will write them terrible messages because they didn't say yes to help them out and forget that they're humans and that they need to have an outside life or see their friends or if they have one thing that they're truly passionate about and that they're activists for, that's amazing and it, and it should be enough. And I think also, especially women get more slack, I personally think, because they're more accessible and they're usually nicer and they'll kind of respond. Um, then, you know, a ballerino, like people aren't going to think they can actually get in contact with him. So they might not be asking him as much, but they expect women to say yes and and step up and, and speak or do talks or do things. And a lot of times, too, they don't want to pay them for their opinions or for what they do. And I think this really needs to change. Uh, if Maggie's asked to be a pundit, she should be paid for the work she's doing because she's doing it, not just because she likes women's sports and she wants to help out 
the sport. It should be whatever you would never call an ex professional male player and, and ask them to do something or step up for a cause or speak somewhere without paying for them. So I'll step off my soapbox. Thank you for stepping onto it in the first place. Um, can, I, can I go to the next question, which is Luis? Uh, I'm going to direct this to you, Kwame. Um, if I remember rightly, Kwame, you're, you're an Arsenal fan, right? No? No, no, no. 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 Chelsea. Chelsea, there you go. That's it. I thought it was some Southern team. Um, <laughs> we've got a question from Luis, which is about Norway and uh, Norwegian and Dutch players and Qatar 2022 and Paris Saint-Germain and Bayern Munich and Qatar. And you know, What's your view on that? As, a, as, as somebody who is a football fan and also an academic who studies these kinds of areas, you know, how do you dis how how do you disentangle all of these things? You know, what, what's what's your personal view on this? Yeah, I just uh, I just saw the the Norway protest uh, yesterday. Came aware of it. I thought it was amazing. I've been discussing this issue uh, with my class uh, for many years. Um, you know, whenever they were awarded the World Cup, we saw you know a number of immigrants from. South Asia and other places in Asia come to come there to you know help build the stadiums and infrastructure and whatnot and uh, you know the gar I think it was the Guardian right that did the that did the investigative report and that showed that you know so many people have died um, in building these you know these structures um, so I think it's amazing I think it's great that these athletes felt um, the need to speak up f felt that they. They were knowledgeable enough about what was going on outside their own context, right? Because a lot of times we have this myopic view of the world and we only know what's going on around us. So I think that's great that they're doing that. Um, I think uh, the tricky thing is, you know, what is going to happen? Um, you know, let's say they do qualify, you know, what type of treatment are they gonna receive, you know, from the locals whenever they go there or any other person or team that decides to protest um, I think that'll be the, the interesting story, you know, come, you know, next year, whenever the World Cup is hosted there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kwame. Um, I'm trying to work through all of these, an uh, incredible number of, uh, of, of questions. Simon, um, sorry, can I just quickly go yeah. back to what Kwame said? You can, that's you can, hard, you can. That's you the can. hardest thing about activism when we talk about it, is that the repercussion, knowing how big the repercussion is going to be, that's what sort of sometimes determines how your ability to want to stand up and say stuff do you know what I mean so obviously what's happening in Norway right now what is going to be the repercussion um and it's actually you wait you have to weigh it up you have to that's what I feel like athletes are always going through weighing it up you know what are the repercussions and if I take that step is it going to be significant enough to the point where it could really be detrimental or is it going to you know is it is, is it going to solve something is it going to create further um benefits for others so it's you're constantly weighing that up in your mind what's the repercussions what's going to be the, the I guess the damage uh, of what I say or what I do. Especially for the, I guess, athletes that aren't like the high profile ones. For athletes that are whole prof high profile, you know, they have less to worry about, I would argue. But the ones that are maybe middle grade, they, I mean, we saw a number of athletes here in 2016, 2017 lose sponsorships after taking a knee following in the footsteps of, you know, Colin Kaepernick. We have a, a, a a question from Sarah, and Sarah, I think you work for FIFA. So I'm going to direct this one to Ariana. Um, what, do, what does FIFA need to know, and what should it be doing? Oh, on which of these topics, though? Because I think there's a lot to be said, and there's a lot of topics that FIFA... So she say, Sarah says, you spoke about how athlete activism impacts brand sponsors, but what, what about impacting sports institutions, more especially speaking about football? What can institutions like FIFA, UEFA do in order to take athlete activism into their core values to ensure a cultural change? From my understanding, I feel like, Sarah, you might know more being inside FIFA than what I know from the outside not being in FIFA. I believe there are some committees within FIFA, though, that are trying to address certain issues. FIFA does have some campaigns say no to racism and things like that. I think the whole world has to change, though, for some institutions. I'm sure the institutions, though, at times are also scared for the damage that can happen, as Maggie said. Um, 
what can happen, what will happen. FIFA obviously can't promote those shirts because the next World Cup will be in Qatar. So if they were the ones that were pushing that, clearly that relationship with that World Cup will be strained and, and more complicated. So I think everything has to be taken into account correctly and, and you have to you have to do more for sure. And I think institutions can be doing more and institutions need to be doing more. Um, but I think it's a complicated balance of, of making sure you're still doing what your, your point is, what your mission statement is and not veering off and then doing what's right and having purpose-driven things. Uh, I think this is a super loaded question and very complicated, but uh, yeah. Okay, you, you, you were very, uh, very diplomatic in answering because you could have destroyed your future FIFA career. Um, let's, ask, let's ask that question of you, Maggie, then in the, in the context of rugby. I thought Ariane asked perfectly well. I thought she just nailed it. If you're doing this in rugby, what would you be telling them? Oh, it's difficult, isn't it? So I think a lot of, uh, so obviously over here we call it national governing bodies. So a lot of national governing bodies, I think, uh, are having to tread quite carefully about how they support athletes when they speak out. So I can only think about over here when we had the Black Lives Matter movement and, you know, certain athletes like Mario Toji, Anthony Watson, a few, um, a few others, you know, were very strong um, about it, really spoke up about it and, you know, were taking the knee. And, and I think you see certain national government bodies go, we, we want to support them, but we just need to be a bit careful how we tread here. Um, is this going to impact our sponsors? Is this, so I think it's fascinating. I think, um, I think it's uh, all I want to see from our national governing bodies is actually support our athletes when they do speak out. But I guess there's a there's a, there's a there's a lot of complicated issues that go behind that. So I'm not really answering the question. I just I just almost echoing Ariana that it's a very complex issue. You know, it's not simple. It's not a simple answer to that. Um, I think institutions need to listen to their athletes, but at the same time, there's an element of you know you've got commercial backers, you've got people who. You know, you've got stakeholders who invest into the game and you've got to make sure you keep them sweet as well. So it's really difficult. Mm. I would say, hold on, I'll, I'll jump in though. I would say that if our institutions start hiring people like Maggie and myself, we can go internally and make a lot of change. Well said. Thank you. Here, here. Um, Kwame, you got a view? What, what do you think that, that governing bodies should be doing? Representative associations? You know, how can they change? Yeah, I just want to echo what they said. Yeah, so. Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, oh, wait, oh, wait. That, that's, that's far too easy. That's an easy way to get out of that. He's, got, he's definitely got an opinion. Well, I was going to we're, we're kind of seven minutes, we're seven minutes away. Yeah, we're running on time. Yeah, we're That's seven minutes excuse. away from finishing. If we'd had more time, I would have let you loose on Kwame. But I'm want another away. webinar. Leave, leave Kwame alone. We're going to move on. Um, so Annabelle is asking, what are everyone's thoughts on the Olympics and, and protest at the Olympics? Thoughts, feelings, views? I think it, yeah. it's coming. Go ahead, Kwame. I've spoken a lot. It's all you. Oh, no. I, I, know, I know they have the rule. Um, was it like rule 52 or something like that that says that, you know, protests are not allowed? I, I can't remember the exact language. Um, but I think, you know, protests have been a... A staple within the Olympics for for so many years. You think about, you know, 1968. You know, John Carlos and Tommy Smith. Yeah, or even, you know, back in the 30s with Jesse Owens. Even though it wasn't like a protest like we may think of it right now, but just him being there, right, was a protest in and of itself. Um, or the protest by the uh, I can't remember her name. Her name escapes me. The Czech gymnast, I believe, also at the 68 Olympics, turning her head um, in protests of uh, Soviet occupation. Um, but when you think about sport, sport is the one venue, in my opinion, that generates the most eyeballs that you can think of. You think about the viewership at uh, the Men's and Women's World Cup. You think about the viewership for the Olympics. At what other time are we going to have that many people looking at a certain spectacle? So I think there's no better time to have, um, a, you know, a type of protest to bring, I guess, attention or awareness to some type of issue. Um, and I know in 2008, uh, for instance, um, there was uh, the issue in Darfur and uh, there was attention brought to that. You know, some athletes said that they wanted to bring attention to it originally, but you know, they didn't want to, but they ultimately did not. But uh, I think it's the greatest venue that we can think of to bring attention to you know, social concerns in our society. Thank you, Kwame. Um, 
we are rapidly running out of time. There's a question from Arna, who is a, hi Arna, somebody else I know from uh, Germany, a journalist. He's asking, where are the limits to athlete activism? What are the limits to athlete activism? Are there limits? Should there be limits? Should it be free for all? I mean, I think, in, I think in some ways it's its own regulator and Maggie explained it quite well. If you're going to have to face the repercussions of what you say or do. So you're also thinking about those things before you do it. If you go too extreme, you might lose your brand unless you're really big athletes like we've already stated too. Um, so the middle echelon, lower athletes have to think about the statements they're making because they're, they have to self-regulate themselves if they want to keep their brand, if they want to keep their voice, if they want their message to be heard and, and to be responded to. So I think there's almost self-regulation there. So I also think as well, like athletes pick the right fight to fight, you know, like I think there's so many issues, like if I think as an athlete and even now, there's so many things I have, I have concerns about and, you know, I, you know, I, I'm passionate about, but I know that if I fight every fight, then my voice is diluted. But if I find the right ones to fight, then all of a sudden I get heard. And I think a lot of athletes do that. So I guess to support Ariana's point, you know, it, it's been self-regulated. It's quite limitless. But at the same time, you also know as an athlete, athlete that I need to pick the right ones to be heard. Otherwise, you know, I don't get heard. So it's a, it's a mixture of both, I'd say. Okay, we've got three minutes left, and I know Maggie, you need to uh, to, to to leave um, in particular. Uh, could I just invite you all? To, to, to give us one final thought or one final comment, possibly you know, looking ahead about what, what needs to happen, what should happen next, what you think it's important for us to, to be looking at, uh, and then we can, uh, we can begin to wind down. So you first, Kwame, you know, a thought, a view, something to think about. Yeah, it comes to, um, I guess, one of the original questions that you had uh, planned for us in terms of who is the, I guess, most powerful activist uh, today. I think uh, that's a tough question to, to answer because there are so many activists out there that are having a great influence. But I think moving forward, I think the greatest action and greatest influence will be collective action. I think the greatest impact we have is, you know, when we come together and not as individuals. So moving forward, I think athletes will start to come together. They're, they're talking about, speaking about, doing a lot of the same things, whether it be here in the States, in Europe, and other, and other you know, places around the world. So whenever, like for instance, you think about what the WNBA did in the run-up to the 2020 election and you know ousting the, one of the sitting senators in Georgia, who also happened to be the owner of the Atlanta Dream, you know, that, that wasn't one person, that was a collective you know, effort. So again, just to reiterate, you know, moving forward, if more athletes will come together on these issues, I think we'll see a lot more, you know, a bigger change. Thanks, uh, Kwame. Ariana. So I just want to highlight one thing that Kwame said earlier, though, which was amazing. He said the men and women's World Cup. And then he said the Olympics, which is funny. And I've never thought about this before. When we think about the Olympics, we think about the Olympics. And then if you speak about what you're going to watch, you would say male or female track and field. Uh, I'm going to watch the women's swim meet. I'm going to watch the men's whatever, because we associate that thing together. So thank you, Kwame, for saying men and women's World Cup. Um, I would say besides that, thinking about how we're identifying things, I think that's super important. It's come up a lot with language, using people's right names, trying to pronounce people's names, understanding that our cultures and borders have completely kind of disintegrated. So sport crosses cultures. So we need to make sure that we're trying to do things or say things correctly. And I think especially too, from a female perspective, because I just have to throw that out there, don't ask women to do something that you wouldn't ask a man at the same level to do. Okay, thank you, Ariana. And Maggie, finally. Well, how do I follow after those two after what they said? Um, okay, right. So I guess the only thing I'm going to say is I would like more, um, I would like more institutions, national government bodies to listen to the athletes. I think that's really powerful. That's, that's, that's something that we've seen over the, over this last period, you know, athletes have such a powerful voice, you know, listen to them uh, or work with them to help find a solution and then the last thing I do is I love quotes so I'm going to throw a quote so um and I truly believe this you know be the change you hope to see in the world you know that's one of the things I always say to everyone regardless of an athlete or yeah we are all we all have the power to create that change so it's important to to be that change so at that point um can I just say what I thought I would get is what I exactly what I got so in organizing this webinar today, I knew I was uh, asking people with very strong 
intelligent views who would clearly express them and, and raise awareness of, of some of the issues that, that we have out there. And, uh, and so Maggie, uh, Ariana, Kwame, really thank you very much. I thank Fabian as well. And, and my feeling is, is, is uh, especially if Fabian, the five of us together, we, we, an hour, we could have gone on for a, a week or a, you know, a month. Uh, we could have our, a, a weekly show on uh, on on you know, Netflix where we could talk about such issues. You know, I, I I thought they I thought okay. And does anybody online now want a, a Netflix series? You know, we're, we're kind of like we're, we'll sit at the front five of us, um, and, and we'll talk about issues of the day. So uh, you know, we are open to offers. Um, but really, I'm really happy with the with with what we discussed because I think it's exactly what I wanted us to to discuss. Can I also thank the audience? Um, and your contribution, your questions, as ever, ask with inquisitiveness and politeness and respect, which I think is really, really important. And that's one of the things that always marks these uh, these webinars. So I think together, you know, for me, uh, that's, that's been great. That's been a quick hour, far too quick. And, and I, I thank you. I thank our guests. I thank uh, everybody in the uh, who attended. Thanks for the questions. Thanks to 16 from EM Lyon for recording and setting up the, uh, the webinar. A recording will be available soon. So thank you. And uh, I'll see you again soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Simon. Thank you. Bye.